Next up, charter school law from the state of Minnesota. Uh, and we have two people here, Amber Reichcoat Young and Bob DeBoer. And Amber, we understand that you're involved in actually one of the other finalists here. Are you going to testify twice today? Or just no. Once? If you want me to, I will. But no, I, uh, I would uh, leave that very much to the others who are so capable of it. Thank you. Well, thank you. A parent called charter schools a wake-up wake call to schools all over. President Clinton called charter schools a real grassroots revolution in public education. We are so honored to be here. All of us are. My name is Ember Reichgott Young, and I'm the Senate author of the original charter school law in Minnesota. And when that bill passed by the thinnest of margins in 1991, we never dreamed that a decade later, there would be 1,700 charter schools serving 350,000 students around the United States and even in Canada. And while Minnesota had pioneered public school choice, charter schools were our answer to providing new and different schools to choose. But let's be clear, the innovation here is not the schools. The law didn't create schools. The law created the opportunity, the catalyst, for teachers and others to create the schools. This changes the system of public education. This is an institutional innovation. And that's what's different here. That's why we can't paint you a picture of it. But I can give you some of the essentials. Schools have the freedom to be better. They get the money. They set up a learning plan. They have to do it within the principles of public education, and they must be accountable. Teachers trade regulation for results, bureaucracy for accountability. No results, no charter. Secondly, the money follows the student. No longer can a school district spend money over here for this bureaucracy when it's generated by the students who are attending school over here. That's a big difference. Alan Auden calls the charter sector America's principal experiment in school-based finance. And finally, useful competition is created. Here's the key. The legislature provides opportunity for someone other than a local school board to create a public school. That's the innovation. In short, the Minnesota legislature removed the barriers and let citizens take the lead. And here are the results. 36 laws in 36 states and the District of Columbia. Good schools get created in urban center cities and rural towns. Teachers like working in them at a time when teacher retention is a key issue. Parents like them. Waiting lists in seven out of 10 schools. And it's just the beginning because the charter law is an evolving, self-improving system. Bottom line, charter schools is the research and development sector of public education. And the district sector is responding by making changes as well. William Daggett said, we must love our children's hopes, dreams, and aspirations more than we love the institutional heritage of the school system. And Bob DeBoer can tell you about that firsthand. I'm a founder of New Vision School in Minnesota. As a teacher and a counselor, I worked with 12th graders who were bright but graduating with sixth grade reading skills. All I could do was empathize and pass them on. Then I had my daughter, Jessie, who was born with special needs. Now I had to do something. Minnesota's charter school law gave me the chance to act on my frustration for those students who were being left behind. It offered the freedom to innovate, but challenged me to be accountable. Annually, for the last seven years, New Vision School has produced a one-year, five-month gain in reading for children who struggled in traditional schools. In my search to help my daughter, we developed cutting-edge interventions for New Visions. For instance, in Boost Up, students spin, roll, throw darts, go on monkey bars. This physical workout stimulates the brain stem, which we have found to be essential for students to learn to read and write well. Educators from 65 schools in nine states have traveled to New Visions to learn how to replicate Boost Up. With EEG neurofeedback, 
children learn how to drive video games with their brain waves instead of their fingers. Through this program, children with ADD or explosive behavior have been able to reduce their medications such as Ritalin. With federal help, we have replicated this program in seven Minnesota districts. Another Minnesota example, New Country School in rural Minnesota was formed by secondary teachers who were tired of kids coming to school to watch teachers work. Learning is entirely project-based there. The school has no courses, no classes, no employees. Through a professional partnership, the teachers contract with the school to run the program. The teachers are the owners of the school. Last month, the Gates Foundation gave $4.5 million to the partnership to help create 15 more such schools. It was exactly 21 years ago today that Jesse came into the world. Today is her birthday. The charter school law provided me the opportunity to help her and hundreds of children like her to achieve their dreams. Thank you very much. And thank both of you. Questions? Yes, Ed Dorn. Uh, great success stories uh, of the kind you just told. Uh, also some stories of uh, disappointment. Can you give me a, a set of metrics uh, that tells me whether or not, on average, the kids who enrolled in charter schools in Minnesota are doing better than kids who are enrolled in the public schools? In Minnesota, first of all, the charter school students reflect those students in the public schools and actually disproportionately represent students of uh, low economic means and com uh, communities of color. Uh, with that, uh, our charter school scores are just slightly higher or the same as others on test scores. But let me just say this. That, I don't think, is the key result to look at with charter schools. The key results are that the satisfaction rates with charter schools are so high. Parents and teachers and students, in study after study, like their charter schools. They come back. They're motivated by them. Seven out of ten schools have waiting lists. We have documentation at Bob Schools and others where students do well, disadvantaged students do so much better in those schools. But not every school succeeds. And that also is a strength of our law because it holds them accountable. And some of them are closed. 5% of the charter schools are closed, and that's how it should be. And in that view, I would say they're more accountable than our district schools. David Osborne. Oh, I'm sorry, Lee Shore. Um, I was wondering whether it seems that the number of charter schools that have, uh, that have been started in Minnesota is more modest than it is in some other states. Yeah. And I wondered whether you attributed that to the fact that they are better, more deliberately planned and implemented there than in other states where the barriers are lower and the oversight may not be as assiduous? Well, we'd certainly like to think that, that they're well planned and, and uh, take a tremendous deliberation. Um, I think there's a number of factors. Uh, first of all, our law does build in accountability, and unfortunately one or two of the laws have not, and that I think has caused some problems in other states. But that accountability is important. The second thing is this. When we passed this bill in Minnesota, it wasn't very easy, and we had to make a number of compromises at the start. And unfortunately, the law didn't work as effectively at the beginning. But once we were able to improve the law and come back and remove some of those barriers, then charter schools took off around 1996 and 97. That's the irony. If you have a law that doesn't, it's not a real charter school law, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't create a lot of schools. Once we remove that barrier, that happened. Another thing. Startup funding was identified as a real problem for charter schools. And that's no longer as much of a problem because states and the federal government have responded. One of the best bipartisan initiatives, uh, you know, charter schools in uh, 1994 got a lot of startup funding. Facilities funding now is coming through in other states as well. So we're overcoming the barriers. David? One of the, as you said, one of the purposes of charter schools has been to uh, create some competition for school districts so that they are pushed to figure out what problems they have, why people are leaving, and solve those problems and improve the quality of their schools. Um, there have been a few studies of, of 
how that impact is working nationwide. I wondered mm -hmm. if you could uh, share some of that data. There has been. Uh, first of all, not only have we an innovative sector within the small schools themselves, but number one, they're transferring over to the larger district because the rules are the same. It's not like private schools which have different rules. So you can transfer these innovations over. But secondly, the district sector is responding. Where there are, where there's even a threat, quote unquote, of charter schools, they do a number of reforms, sometimes low cost reforms. When there's an actual charter school across the street, they do high cost reforms, like all day kindergarten, like a number of different teacher training programs. Um, this, uh, this is happening all over. Um, bottom line, it's mobilizing change at all levels, from the smallest charter school to the largest school district. Bill Klinger. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go back to uh, the metrics question that uh, Ed Dorn uh, posed originally, and that is, what data do you have about teacher retention in charter schools versus other schools? Just recently, the National Education Association did a survey of its own charter school teachers within the organization, those that organized. Um, and they asked them, do you like being in a charter school? And three to one, they said they would do it again. I thought that was a powerful study. As far as retention of teachers in charter schools, all we know is that it's attracting school, it's attracting teachers, many of whom would have otherwise left the profession. It's attracting entrepreneurial school, uh, school teachers, and it is also maintaining a number of teachers. As far as data, I'm sure there's a lot of research out there. I might need to get some of that for you, but I don't have it here. Yeah, Pat? I thought I read somewhere along here that uh, your very interesting governor did not mm -hmm. at first endorse this program. How does it feel now? First of all, the program was created under the leadership of um, uh, Governor Arne Carlson, who at first was not all that excited about it. But you know, he really warmed up to it and really helped us to improve the law so we could uh, in turn um, create more charter schools and now is one of our biggest advocates. Our current governor, Governor Jesse Ventura, is also a supporter. He does uh, view it as something that he wants to see accountability and we all agree with that. So we are getting good support. You know what my disappointment is? It's not in the public policy sector. My disappointment is this, that school districts don't see charter schools as the uh, opportunity for change in their district that it really is. That, that this is what mobilizes change. It mobilizes that change that um, they might want to do. A superintendent in Minnesota once said, you know, I can't make the changes I want to make in this school district until a charter school opens up across the street. And that's precisely the dynamic here that we're trying to educate sponsors and, uh, and school districts to, to realize there's an opportunity here with charter schools. Our time, our, yep. What you're saying is that if you were to be selected as one of the top 10 projects, your governor isn't going to turn around and say, well, it'll do all right. Oh, no, our governor and lieutenant governor are very are supportive of charter schools, absolutely. They are. Yes. Okay. Yes, we met with them, the site visitor did. And did you have inf any information other than that? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's out here a lot and, you know, other places. No, he's, Hawaii. On, he's on they, television. They basically <laughs> see it as an extension of choice in public schools. It's just another choice for uh, the American public. Norm Rice, where our time is up. Norm, would you like to ask one uh, brief question? How do you deal with the uh, special needs demands of uh, different, and, and where do you get your funding sources? Well, in Minnesota, uh, there's a bill back between districts and it's also state funding for special ed uh, services. It is very challenging for charter schools where you maybe only have 100, uh, 150 children to provide all the services of a district of 40,000. And so it's, it's a, the key to it is developing good relationships with the traditional districts uh, to collaborate in providing those services. But uh, Minnesota has been in the forefront uh, of answering that question for charter schools. Uh, the state uh, board of education, the Department of Children, Family, and Learning have allocated money to, for a director of special ed for charter schools. So they specialize in addressing those unique needs.